tonight. We give you glory in this place. We thank you that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are Master. You are Ruler. You are Savior. You are Healer. You are Deliverer. You are Helper. You are Provider. You are Sustainer. How many of you are grateful for Jesus tonight? Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Man, it's nothing like lifting up the name of Jesus. And that's the whole purpose of our gathering tonight. Not about a personality, not about an individual. It's all about Jesus. The name that is above every name. The Bible said... That at the sounding of that name there's coming a day that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess of heaven in the earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord can I give you one more I just want to encourage you with the word there is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved except the name of Jesus. Give him one more shout of praise for salvation in that name. Praise God. Praise God. Well, won't you high five about three people around you and tell them his name is Jesus, if you didn't know, before you're seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, good to see all of you and so glad uh, to be here Wednesday night. Anybody excited to be here at midweek? Come on. I think Wednesday night are the people that say for real, real. You know, they're saved for real, and then there's for real, real. This is the for real, real crowd. And so, good to see all of you here, despite the weather and everything, you're here. And, and, and God bless each and every one of you for being committed to God's house here at midweek. And, and I know, um, I, I remember all the time that, you know, when it comes to our pastor, you know, when pr pastor appreciation and stuff, I never will forget he would always say this. If you want to be appreciative or pastor appreciation, you always be faithful to God's house. That's my appreciation. And um, how many of you appreciate your pastor tonight, Pastor Franklin and Cerise? We love them and we honor them. And um, we honor them by being here tonight, and I know that's his heart. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to a, a couple of places tonight. I want to go to the book of Luke chapter 10. I'm going to start at Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read a few passages of Scripture, and then I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 9 and read a couple of passages also. Uh, Luke chapter 10, if you don't have it, they're going to put it up on the screen for you. Or you can look over at your neighbor's Bible or phone or tablet or if need be, just snatch it from him. Tell him it's better to give than it is to receive. <laughs> you don't read it anyway, but anyway. <clears throat> it's a, a, an accessory to your outfit. You know, no, let me hush. Let me quit. Luke chapter 10. Let's go. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, and with your strength, and with your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, let me give you this story to demonstrate what I'm talking about. He said there was a certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves. He was stripped of his clothing. He was wounded. And he was uh, left for dead, left half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, notice that, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan... As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring, pouring oil and wine. He uh, set him on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, let's jump over to Matthew chapter 9 for the sake of time. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says this, then Jesus went about all the cities, villages, teach about all the cities and villages, teaching, notice that in their synagogues, 
preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary, scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. And I'll stop right there. And I want to use these different te- these two texts to actually set up what I want to talk to you about tonight. But as you know, as, as, as we started this past Sunday and have been talking and, um, and communicating um, about, and even uh, Pastor Blake and Laura reiterated tonight that we have begun or in the middle of our Heart for series uh, here at our church. And in thinking of this and in light of this, um, there was something that really stirred my heart that I want to talk to you about tonight that I think goes along. And, the, and, and my prayer is that something would grip all of us afresh and anew based upon what I'm going to talk about in light of this heart for. How many know it's important what we're doing out in the community? How many, how many know that it's about making a difference? How many know that we're here, come on, as the church... Our purpose is to be a solution to a problem. Come on, we're here because we're to be a solution. We're here because we're to be an answer. Amen? God put us here and called us here. You know, the church of the living God, this local assembly, not just to be here to gather, but to infiltrate every aspect of our community for the sake of advancing the kingdom and seeing souls saved and lives changed. And so I want you to start out with this little thought. I want to teach a little bit because we have said heart four. But I want to give you this tagline, in order to have a heart for, you need to have a heart of. In order to have a heart for, it's important that you start with a heart of. A heart of what, Javon? A heart, write this down, of compassion. A heart of compassion. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight. My my intent is not to preach you into emotional hype, but to instill something in your spirit that would grip all of us and say, Lord, re-baptize me again with a fresh sense of compassion when it comes to people. What is compassion? It's defined as sympathetic conscientiousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Isn't that something? Compassion shows sympathy. It gives support. It demonstrates sacrifice. Compassion, listen to what I'm about to say, is passion with a heart. Compassion is not a feeling, but compassion is a commitment to get involved with hurting people. Compassion moves me from feeling to action, or it's when I put feet to my feelings. So when I just say I feel compassion, it's not enough to feel it. We have to do something about what we feel. So compassion is love in action. It's a verb. Understand when it comes to compassion, when it's mentioned in the Bible, watch this. When it's associated with God the Father, the scripture said he's full of compassion. When it comes to Jesus Christ, it says that he was moved with compassion. So understand, to be godly is to be full of compassion. And to be Christ-like is to be moved with compassion. And I want to tell you that if you are full of it, I guarantee you'll be moved by it. If you're full of compassion, you'll be moved by compassion. When I look at the life of Jesus, I believe that one of the key factors when it comes to his ministry, it was a ministry that was marked by compassion. Listen quickly as I go through these. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14 says, and Jesus, when he saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Matthew 15 says this, it says this, and he called the disciples unto them and said, I have compassion on the multitude and he fell them. Matthew 20 says this, Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes and immediately their eyes was open. Matthew chapter one said he was moved with compassion. He put forth his hand and said, be clean. Matthew chapter six says this, he was moved with compassion toward them because they were like sheep having no shepherd. And then in Luke chapter seven, the Bible said is when the Lord saw her speaking of a lady who had lost her son and they were in 
began a processional care in the coffin, the Bible said that he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And he came and touched the coffin and her dead son was raised to life again. What are you saying, Javon? Every time you see Jesus being moved with compassion, there was a power, there was a, there was a force that was released within him that went out unto the multitude. And the scripture said this, that the dead was raised, demon powers were broken, the sick was healed, he provided and met needs. In other words, come on, compassion looks for the sinning, it looks for the sick, it looks for the suffering, it looks for the seeking, and it looks for those that are hurting and broken. And what I love about that, did you catch it? Notice that compassion preceded the miraculous. When there was a move of compassion, there was a release of miracles. And could it be that instead of praying for a move of God, we need to start praying for a move of compassion? Because if, come on somebody, if compassion starts moving, could it be that miracles will start happening? So compassion preceded the miraculous. Understand 1 John chapter 3, 17 says this, whosoever has this world's good and, he, and see his brother have need, but listen to these words, but shuts up his bowels of compassion from him. How does he love, how does the love of God dwell in him? That's an interesting statement. Bowels of compassion. Now, wait a minute. Let's talk about bowels for a minute. Because literally, yeah, we know bowels biologically. Now, let me just say this, and just bear with me. In biologically, if your bowels move on the inside, there's going to be some action on the outside. Your bowels can't move and you be still. Oh, Somebody looking at me weird and funny. We're going to hand out some x lax out there. No, anyway. But, but you know what I'm saying? That when your bowels move, when they're, they're, it's, it's within, oh my God, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. And this, 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 these pains and this, you know, the beat, sweat, or whatever happens to you. But something says, no, no, I got, I got to go. In other words, something goes on inside of you that is so strong that says, I can't sit here. I've got to go do something. Come on. And when the scripture said, notice, when when you have the ability to be a blessing to somebody, but yet you shut up your bowels of compassion, how can you say the love of God is in you? We always say it. You can't do everything, but you can do something. You can give a high five. You can give a hug. You can give a nice gesture, but could it be that if we're not careful, we can be suffering from constipated compassion? That we are so stuck up at all. Oh, you don't want to. So you, we're so stuck up on ourselves and self-centered and selfish don't care about nothing but our own needs and need my needs and what I need could it be that the key to getting your needs met is reaching out and helping me someone else's need maybe if compassion comes through me blessings will come to me I'm just teaching tonight somebody say compassion Understand that Jesus said the harvest is truly plenty, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers in the harvest field. When I read that, I said, hmm. I said, I know we pray for souls. And the Bible says when Zion travails, babies are born. I know we intercede. But according to that scripture, we don't have a harvest problem. We don't have a soul problem. We have a labor pro laborer problem. That scripture said that there is abundant crop, but labor shortage. He said, no, 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 no. The harvest is plenty. What I'm lacking is those who are willing to go outside of the four walls of the church like we're doing at Heart 4. What I need is not souls. I need labors. Notice this. Not in the church necessarily, but out in the harvest field that will go beyond the four walls of the church. He said there's abundant crop but labor shortage. There's a, there's a bad case of unemployment in the harvest field. And what you got to understand, oh gosh, listen, listen to what I'm about to say. He called us to
to be the harvesters. The message translation says there's no hands for, there's no harvest hands. We got harvest, but no harvest hands. No harvest hands. Hands that are not willing to get dirty. Hands that only want to touch certain things and do certain things. But, but harvest hands. I need harvest hands. And think about this. You and I have been called, the church has been called to be the laborers or the harvest hands of God. Watch this. You see, see, ah, they always require, watch this, more reapers than sowers. Because Ah, your harvest is always bigger than your seed. Oh, come on now. Follow with me. Because see, see, the, oh, over 2,000 years ago, there was a seed sown into the earth called Jesus. I know we say he was buried, but he was a seed from the Father that was sown in the earth. Are you following me? It was a seed sown, not buried, but planted, if you're following me. Come on, Wednesday night. This is the crowd. I'm just teaching for a month. He was sown into the earth. And this is what I love about the word of God because the word is a seed. And see, this is why you got to understand that the grave could not hold Jesus down. You want to know why? Because he told us back in Isaiah that when I send my word out, it will accomplish that in which I please and prosper where I send it to. And watch this. It will not come back to me void. So I don't care what hell tried to do to Jesus, God said, he ain't going to come back to me until he accomplished everything that I sent him in the earth to do. And I want to tell you, God the Father sowed the seed of his son. Come on. And there's a harvest of, watch this, God sowed the seed, Jesus was the seed, and guess what? By the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I have been called to reap. I want to know tonight and Wednesday night, do I have any reapers in the house? Do I have anybody that says, Lord, fill my heart with compassion and help me win the harvest. Ugh. Jesus. It's about souls being saved and lives being changed. Now understand, let me look at this, what, what, make this point. Jesus is talking to this lawyer. I want to show you some points about compassion in this story. Jesus began to make the talks to this little lawyer, you know, who thinks he knows everything. He was a lawyer, which means he was, he was skilled in the law. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's your first mistake. Because number one, you would think with all that you know, you would know that you can't inherit eternal life. He had an inheritance mentality. You can inherit cars, you can inherit houses, you can inherit land and property, but you cannot inherit eternal life. Marvel not, you must be born again, the scripture says, because understand, I put it like this, eternal life is not the result of good works, but the results of God's grace. My God, we just sang about it. His good grace, it's a result of his grace. And then the Bible said this, he, he goes on and say, he says, well, what does the law say? And he said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and spirit. Love thy neighbor and yourself. He said, good, now go do it. Did you catch that? Yes. He, sa he said, yeah, you know it, but now go do it. Oh, I'm going to teach here. <laughs> we got to get to a place. It's not enough if I just know the word. The question is, am I doing the word? It's not enough that I can quote it. The bigger question is, am I living it? Am I living out what I'm shouting about? Am I living out what I'm, come on, singing about? I know you finished all four phases of SOD, but what are you doing with all of that word? Are you just telling how great thou art and how much you know? I'm telling you, God is not impressed about how many scriptures he can quote. God looks down and say, how many can you live? How many can you live as a husband? How many can you live as a wife? Because if we're not careful, we'll, we'll spend most of our time majoring in church, but minoring in life because we got this vernacular that sounds spiritual, but no fruit being bared in my life. Come on, somebody. Let me, let me propose this question. If you were being arrested for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Okay. Let me get back over here. He said, who is my neighbor? 
Who's my neighbor? Jesus said, let me, show, let me tell you this story. There was a certain man. There was a certain man who went down from Jericho to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among these thieves, robbed, beat up, tore up, left for dead in the ditch, half dead, the scripture said. I love that it said half dead. Because if you're half dead, you're still half alive. And if you're half alive, God can make you whole again. Come on, somebody. Ooh, I'm half dead. Well, you're half alive too, so what? get it together. But the Bible said that there was the priest, there was the Levite, and there was the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, which gives us, watch this, it represents three attitudes toward hurting people. Because the Bible said the priest walked by on the other side and looked and kept walking. That's the attitude of careless. And then the Bible said the Levite, he came, did you read it? He came to the place. He looked. Ooh, uh uh-uh. Oh, no. I don't don't do, I don't do, mm mm-mm. He was concerned. But the Bible said the good Samaritan, he was compassionate. And he came to where he was, and he picked him up. He began to bind him up clean him up, bandage him up, put him on his donkey and take him into an inn, to an innkeeper that kept him. He paid him. He said, and anything else you do, watch this. I'll make it good tomorrow when I come. I want to give you real quick. I want you to, because this thing is, is, is just loaded with stuff about compassion. So are you ready? Write the first one down. Write this down. That number one, when you talk about compassion, compassion comes to where people are. Notice he came to where this man was. The other guy stayed on the other side, but he came, and I love it because he got down off of his donkey, which represents he he was willing to leave his position and come down to where the people were hurting. It represents compassion has to have a sense of humility that I'm willing to humble myself and leave my position. Notice he could have kept riding. He was out t- having, a, you know, test driving a, a 365 donkey that day. He was having a good time. He was checking it out. He was riding good, had a GPS on it, you know, and everything. And he could have kept on. But something says, I'm willing to leave the comfort of my own position. And even if I'm inconvenienced, my temporary inconvenience is it does not outweigh what I could do to make an impact for eternity. I'm willing to come from where I am. And see, that's what we got to do. When you got compassion, you got to be willing to go where people are. Find out where they are. Where are they hurting? Where are they broken? Where are they going through? What are they going through? And I thought about that coming to where you are. Listen to this. There's a story that, that's, that consider, there's a guy by the name of Christopher Searcy was playing basketball with his friends on May 16th. In uh, 1998, he was shot in the chest and a bullet uh, perforated his aorta. His friends helped him get within, listen to this, 40 feet of the entrance to the Ravenswood Hospital and then went inside and asked for help. The hospital staff refused to help Christopher saying that it was against the hospital policies to administer aid to those outside the hospital. Eventually, a police was a, a policeman was able to get a wheelchair and wheel Christopher into the hospital, and where he was helped by the by the helped by the hospital staff. It was too late. Too late. However, Christopher died about an hour later. Did you catch that? He was forty feet from the entrance of the hospital. But because of our policies and because I'm not willing to come from my position. Ah, God. And and, and really, come on, people over policy. I'm not willing to come from my position to help someone. Here is a teenage guy that lost his life because somebody wasn't willing to be inconvenienced for a moment 40 feet away and he died. God help us that we don't have that type of mentality that I'm so concerned with my position or even my status that it would keep me 40 feet away from saving a life. Oh, I'm, okay. 
Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might save some. I'm willing to go where they are to make a difference. Listen to what the message says. I love this. Paul said, even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily became a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I, be, I have become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempt to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all of this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Come on. Let's not just talk about making a difference. Let's go out through heart for and be a difference. Can I get a big amen right there and I'll move on. Whoo. Oh. The Bible said this. You need the second thing I want to give you. Compassion breaks down barriers and build bridges. Notice the Bible said that, that it was a good Samaritan. Jesus used the Samaritan to teach a lesson to two Jews. Now, if you understand the history of these two different types of pe these people, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They were considered to be uh, 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 half-breeds because they, they had mixed ancestry. And the Jews would absolutely avoid the entire city taking the long way around route to the temple just because they didn't want to touch or be around those type of people. See, I'm sure it messed up the, 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 the Jew, Jewish lawyer in a sense that he called the Samaritan good because they saw no good in any Samaritan. Be careful who you say who's good and who's not good. You don't know who's good and who's not good. You didn't create them, so you don't get to determine and judge not things before time. Uh, yeah, Jesus said, I'm going to call good what you call no good. I'm going to call a blessing what you call a cursing. I'm going to call treasure what you think is only trash. But what I love about this Samaritan, he could have said, look, they ain't never done nothing for us. They don't even like us anyway. He don't, they don't like my kind. But instead, he said, no, I am compelled with compassion. And my compassion is going to break down this bar Oh, God, this barrier. Come on, I need you to stay with me. Of prejudice, of not wanting to deal with somebody that don't act like me, sound like me, look like me, feel like me, live like me, be like me. No, no, no. When I'm full of compassion. Oh, come on, somebody. I look on over all that stuff. What I don't see is skin. What I see is a soul that needs to be saved and a life that needs to be changed. Oh, I'm going to preach right here. I remember when I first started ministry here in Gainesville, I remember starting out as a young preacher, not knowing a whole lot, having just, just wanted to do whatever, needing all the encouragement I could get. And one of the things that hurt me in the beginning, and I've only shared this publicly when I preach this sermon, is I remember being looked at, and I ain't going to call no names by another preacher, it, here, somewhere, in this area, that looked at me and said, I can't believe you serve in that white man's church. Oh, I, know it's gonna, I knew that was going to mess with you. I knew it, I knew it. But, but, but I'm being real. I ain't got time to be phony and fake. I can't believe God didn't give you that gift to serve a white man. And I'm confused. You're, you're a pastor. You're older than I am. Probably could be my great-grandfather. And, and, and this is what I get. I don't get that I'm proud of you, that you made it out, that you're not another statistic, that you did something with your life, that you didn't let the devil take you out. I can't. Can I not get? I'm proud of you. Oh my God. I didn't come here. It ain't about serving no white man. Because we, come on, when did it become a black gospel, a white gospel, a blue gospel, a green gospel? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise. Away with the foolishness. I serve him. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. That's what's wrong. We got to get over this foolishness. Come on. Church of God. Church of God in Christ. Presbyterian. Pentecostal. Come on. Come on. Whatever else is out there. Come on. Let's come together and lift Jesus up and win a city, win a nation, win a world for the glory of God. Sit down. I got to finish. Oh, I feel some stirring. Put my foot on that thing. The devil is a lie. That's why I'm glad I'm part of a church that looks like heaven. Oh, can I go back to VBS? Oh! They used to sing that song. God loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Give me one more shout of praise. I feel something pushing me. Compassion. Compassion says... It doesn't just have sight, but compassion has vision. There's a difference between sight and vision. (laughs) Sight sees what you are. Vision sees what you can be. There was a man by the name of Marvin Sapp. He wrote a song that said, you look beyond my faults and you saw my needs. Isn't it funny that the priest saw him and the Levites saw him? But when the the Samaritan looked at him, he didn't see what they saw. Because he wasn't looking through the eyes of man. He was looking through the redemptive eyes of God. I'm not going to see him like you see him. Help me to see him like God sees them. Because I know, oh my God, when they looked at Saul, some saw an assassin. But when God looked at him, he saw an apostle. Some saw a murderer, but God saw a minister. Some saw Jacob a trickster, but God saw a prince with God. And my God, the devil has tried to label some of you and said, you're an alcoholic. You're an addict. You're messed up. You're jacked up and you're this. No, God doesn't see you as any of that. He sees you as a child of God made in his image and his likeness don't let the devil call you what God had created you to be that's sight I see you I see you I see you I see you notice I see you I see you intensive care unit. No, what we need is intensive compassion units. I see you. I see you in the ICU room. Nobody's thinking about color. Nobody's thinking about age. They're all working together for the betterment of that person. It's probably one of the best examples that we as a church can get. Go visit an ICU room and see how everybody is working together for the betterment of one individual because compassion says I see you when you're hurting. I see you when you're broken. I see see you when you're down and out and I just don't see you I want to come and be intensive and intentional about bringing you compassion last point understand compassion considers how it receives compassion oh gosh did you hear what I just said compassion considers how it received compassion. Could it be that that Samaritan said, look, I know I'm riding on a donkey now. I got a little money in my pocket. Got a little oil, a little something, something. But I haven't always been here. <laughs> Could it be that because for that, he had a flashback and said, I've been there before. I hadn't always been where I am today. I haven't always had what I had. See, compassion considers the compassion it has received. Where were you before God found you? Where were you? Some of you are here tonight because the wreck didn't kill you. 
The overdose didn't take you out. The abuse didn't drive you crazy out of your mind. Some of you know it was nothing but the grace of God that you are here tonight. And when you understand, I got to consider that. Don't you come in here with some high-minded haughtiness and chest out, holier than thou. No, we can't be fault finders. We got to be grace givers. Uh, Compassion is not condescending. Compassion is not critical. But compassion, come on somebody, considers the compassion that it was given. Let me tell you what, see, instead of trying to put them in their place, how about putting yourself in their place? (laughs) Brother, if you see a man or a woman overtaken in a fault, Galatians says, you that are spiritual, you that know it all, You that said, I've been in church for 30 years, I'm mature, I'm mature. It says, you that are spiritual, okay, I'm going to see how spiritual you are. It says, restore them. Restore them. Help them get back up. Help them get going again. And what I love with a spirit of meekness, considering yourself. Basically, this could be you. Oh, this could be your child. What if that would you be that critical if that was your daughter? Would you be that ugly if that was your son? What if it was your wife? How would you want them to be treated? God Almighty. His compassion says, No, 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 no. I'm gonna humble myself. Because here's the reality with a lot of us. Yeah, many of us might know your here it is, your 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 ministry testimony. That's the one you tell everybody but we don't know your testimony. Uh, Oh, I'm coming for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you got a testimony you tell us, but you also got one that's just between you and God. And even now, some of you getting uncomfortable because you know there's some stuff that you've done and been in that only God knows, and you are glad that I can't hack it right now and put it up on that screen because, oh, we would be shocked. But thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and washes us. Stay to your feet. I'm done. I end with this story. I close with this story. Because the last thing is this. Compassion always sees the spiritual side. Watch this, of doing natural things. See, right now, we, we, got, we got about close to 300 natural things, opportunities left to be filled across our campuses for, fine, for, for Heart 4. 300 natural things that many will look at and say, ooh, that's just raking leaves, ooh, that's painting. But no, 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 compassion, watch this, sees the spiritual side of doing practical things. And I'm going to go ahead and declare by faith that that I believe that before this week's out, all 300 of those spots are going to be filled in Jesus' name. Because there's about, come on, I believe there's about 40 of you in here tonight that you say, you know what, I got to get up off the sideline. I got to do something. God's been too good to me for me to sit here and I can't do nothing. So I'm, I'm prophesying that every slot be filled in Jesus' name. But listen to what he's saying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on this and we're going to pray. Compassion sees the spiritual side of doing natural things. While walking home from school, a boy named Mark noticed the boy ahead of him had stumbled to the ground and dropped everything he was carrying. Mark hurried to the boy's side and helped him collect his belongings. Surprisingly, the boy was carrying uh, an, a, 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 special, a, a real big hefty load. There was a baseball glove, a bat, a couple of sweaters, and a small tape recorder, and an armful of books. Mark helped him carry the things home and his new friend Bill was almost appreciative of his was all was all most appreciative of his pa- his compassion during the walk home Mark discovered Bill was struggling in school and had just broken up with his girlfriend when they arrived at Bill's house he invited Mark in for a coke and they spent the rest of the afternoon talking laughing watching TV although the two boys never became real close friends they kept up with each other throughout the rest rest of of junior high and high school And several weeks before the graduation, Bill approached Mark and asked him 
if he remembered that day that he met Mark and when he helped him with all of his stuff. Listen to this. Mark nodded as he remembered. Bill then asked, did you ever, ever wonder why I was carrying so many things that day? Without pausing for an answer, Bill explained he had cleaned out his locker and was going home to take his life. He had been storing away sleeping pills and was headed home to end it all when Mark happened to come alongside to help him out. Bill told Mark how that simple act of compassion inspired him to go on living. He said, Mark, when you picked up my books that day, you saved my life. Imagine how many times that we've looked over the practical because we didn't deem it as spiritual. It's not going to be a prophecy every time. It's not going to be a prophetic word every time. It's not going to be, come on, lay hands and they fall out and get a drop cloth every time. It's not they're going to fall back speaking in tongues. And we believe in all of that. We believe we are that. But it's not going to be that every time. Could you understand the most spiritual thing that that man did was pick up some books that caused a life, come on, that was on his way to kill himself, to live? So here... Here's my prayer as I close. So wonder what God's going to do when we're out in this community. I've been praying this. That every, come on, that all of us would see the spiritual side of every practical outreach that we do over these next several weeks. And I'm praying that every practical thing that we do, that it would be a life-altering, life-changing, that eternity would be affected, even if I'm moving a mop, if I'm blowing leaves, if I'm painting a house. Because the Bible said, all that you do, when you do it, you do it unto the Lord, and it is spiritual in His sight. So throw your hands up tonight. And say, Lord, I ask you to baptize me with a fresh heart of compassion. Right now, I ask you to move me out of my comfort zone. Move me out of complacency. Move me to do something to make a difference in someone else's life. Speak to me tonight. Speak to me now on what you would have me to do to make a difference in the life of people. And I thank you in advance that compassion is going to flow through me like never before. And we're going to see miracles. We're going to see breakthroughs. We're going to see souls saved. And we're going to see lives changed. In Jesus' name. Now give God a great big shout of praise and thank Him for it. Come on, let's lift our hands and sing, I will build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. room tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior compassion is here I don't care what you did and where you've gone wrong and how you've messed up compassion is looking for the sinning for the sick for the seeking for the suffering tonight looking like Jesus said he saw he sees the multitude and say I'm here tonight I'm the answer I'm the solution I'm the peace if you'll surrender your life to me I know how to make you whole again, how to make you new again, because compassion knows how to restore us to a life that we never thought, dreamed, or imagined we could have. And so tonight, I want to ask you a question. If that's you, are you ready to surrender? We love you. We're a church that love people and care about people and have compassion for people, and we want to see your life be the best life that God created, but it starts with surrendering to Him. 
If you said, Javon, you're talking to me. I feel his touch tonight. I feel that compelling of the Holy Spirit. I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to give it all. Pray for me. I need his forgiveness. I'm ready to surrender Jesus right where you're standing. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes because we're a family. But right where you're standing, if that's you, as quickly as you can, I want you to shoot your hand up. I want to pray for you right where you're standing. Raise it up high. I want to see it. Anybody see that hand? Yep, yep. See those hands over there? Yep, yep. See those hands right there? Anybody else? I see you over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody else? Anybody? Oh, I see you back there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Now, this is what I want to do. We're going to have compassion one for another. If you saw anybody around you, raise their hand. Lean over and gently put your hand on their shoulder. And we're going to pray this prayer together with them. We're going to be like the Samaritan. We're going to come to where they are. And we're going to pray with them right now. Are you ready? Say, Jesus, I surrender my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and wash me in your blood. I receive your forgiveness. I'm a new creation. I'm moving forward and my life will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Every one of you that prayed that prayer, when you leave this service, I want you to go out to our Connection Lounge and tell them you just prayed that prayer and to get me signed up for next steps because we want to help you in your next step of getting connected and being in community in our church. God bless you. We love you. Stop by the Connection Lounge and let's fill up those slots for Hot 4. We love you. And don't forget this Sunday, Pastor Franklin will be right back here this Sunday, live preaching. It's going to be awesome. Why don't you invite someone, bring someone. It's going to be an amazing time. God